Thanks, everybody. Um, some great discussions already going on, some really uh, wonderful work going on in the groups, and it's fantastic to see. And we'll get back into that, of course, after lunch. Um, but uh, I'm just going to give uh, a, a little talk now about some tools which you, you may find useful. Um, things which are out there which uh, you know, can help your research, not just for this project, but generally. Uh, and uh, also sort of introduce you to a few possibilities. Yeah, as I say, I want to introduce you to the digital humanities community. You've probably never heard of the digital humanities community, and you're wondering what it's all about. Well, look, this is something that's made this nice little infographic, which actually gives you a, a quantitative uh, view of the digital humanities community. And I'm not going to go into any of this now. I just want to show you that it's something that's happening all over the world. Uh, and uh, lots of money being spent on the US, not so quite so much money in Australia, unfortunately. Uh, and it's something which is growing. Um, why would you be interested in the digital humanities community? Well, because we, and I count myself as a digital humanist, we make stuff. We make tools, uh, we develop technologies, and we share stuff. We talk about what we're doing, we share our code, we help other people. It's a really sort of one of the, the, uh, the characteristics of the community is a, 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 a desire to, to share information, to share approaches. And so if you want to uh, find out what's happening in the digital humanities community, for example, uh, you can go along to this site, which is called Digital Humanities Now, which uh, pulls material from the various blogs around the world where people are discussing what they're doing with material. And this includes historians, of course, and also includes uh, literature scholars, uh, all sorts of humanists who are starting to use digital tools in their work and their research. Uh, and there's some fascinating examples of what you can do with this material uh, and, and how you can start to visualize it, analyze it. Um, if you want to just, uh, if you've got a particular question that you would like some help with, there's also a, um, a, a site which actually specifically set up in order to answer your questions. Um, it's uh, it's a, a site where you just, uh, here we go. So you basically, if, you, if you're um, tackling a research project, you're not quite sure where to start, you're not sure what tools to use, you can go along to this site and you can ask a question and somebody in the digital humanities community will jump in and give you some help. Uh, and of course, if you just want to stay connected with what's happening, um, we are fortunate in that we've actually just established well, last year an Australasian Association for the Digital Humanities. Um, and uh, as a member of the executive committee, I'm contractually obligated to say that you should join the, uh, the Australasian Association for the Digital Humanities. We had our first conference earlier this year. So there's a growing group within Australia who are starting to look at the uh, possibilities for using these sorts of technologies and what we might do with them. Okay, but I was going to talk about tools, wasn't I? Tools. And there are lots and lots and lots of tools. Um, if we go to this slide, This is uh, basically a, a categorised list of tools uh, which uh, are thought to be useful in terms of the digital humanities uh, by the, assembled by the Bamboo Project, which is a, a sort of big umbrella project within the digital humanities. Um, it includes um, a whole lot of things that you'll be familiar with, sort of uh, commercial services, things like Google Docs are in there as well, because they are useful as a collaborative platform for this sort of work. Um, but there's also a lot of things which you wouldn't have heard of. Uh, uh, tools which people have been developing uh, to, to tackle specific problems but can also have more general applications as well. Um, you can have uh, tools, for example, which help you analyse large amounts of text. If you wanted to uh, examine uh, word frequencies within a text, for example, there are tools which will help you do that. If you wanted to pull out all the names of people within the text, that's called name entity recognition. And there are a number of tools uh, which are available which help you do that sort of work as well. Um, it's, it's a fascinating area and there's new stuff being developed all the time. Um, there was a, a big digital humanities conference in Europe recently and there was uh, you know, four or five <coughs> new tools which I didn't know anything about which popped up during the discussions there. So it's worth just keeping an eye on and see how some of this material might relate to the sort of work that you want to do and the possibilities that it does raise for, for new avenues of research. Now I'm not going to... Uh, oh, I've got to set my timer again. Um, anyway, the... Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into detail of the, all, these, all these tools, obviously, because there are hundreds of them listed here, but I do want to talk about one in particular. And that is Zotero. 
Now, um, you already know about Zotero because it's what I've been using all morning. This is Zotero. Uh, Zotero is a way of uh, managing your research. I mean, I've been using it here just as a way of sort of collecting bookmarks so that I have them easily accessible. And you can do a lot more with it as well. Um, Zotero uh, is really useful because um, you can save material from existing databases. For example, if you're in a library catalog uh, and you want to save a reference, uh, it will quite likely be that you can, there will be a little icon in the, uh, the uh, uh, location bar of your browser. You click on that icon and Zotero will save the bibliographic information automatically to your own research database. So you have it there uh, to manage and use. Now, there's uh, a, a couple of um, other neat little things about Zotero. Um, if we just go into the Trove newspaper database, for example. I didn't set a date range, but anyway, for the purposes of this demonstration, it doesn't matter. Um, I just want to show you that uh, if we look at a, a particular newspaper article, uh, and it's something that's interesting and we want to save it, see this little icon which pops up here? <coughs> that's being put there by Zotero, and we can just click on that, and it will save the details of that newspaper article to our own research database. So we go back here, and we see that newspaper article has popped up here. Uh, and not only that, it's also saved a PDF of that article locally. So if you have it within your own database, which you can look at offline, you may have to be connected to the web. Um, it also, just as a, in terms of uh, capturing information about websites, uh, as I say, it's a bit more than just this sort of standard bookmarking tool, because um, you'll see you have just, if you right click on a, any web page, you have Save Zotero Snapshot from current page. You click on that, and again, it will uh, effectively save the URL, save a bookmark. But what it also does, which is really useful, is it does save a snapshot of that page in your own research database. So does it then, Jim, does it take whatever metadata set is used by the particular database that you're looking at? Yeah, it, it varies. Um, there's different ways that it gets information. Uh, some uh, databases which expose their metadata in standard ways, it can sort of pull automatically. Um, you know, that when it's just capturing a web page, it will just be capturing the sort of title of the web page. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can also construct what are called translators. Um, so they're little bits of custom code which people um, write and contribute to the project. And they enable information to be um, obtained from specific databases. So the reason why you can capture uh, that information from Trove, for example, from the newspapers database, is because I wrote a translator oh, which does that. Mm, yeah. Okay? So uh, it uh, gets the, the metadata, the structured data from the page, uh, and it saves it into your, to your research database. Once it's in your own research database, you can organize it however you want. You can add notes, you can add tags. Um, so you can then start to sort of uh, develop your, your own uh, research collection. So what do you mean by you wrote a translator? Uh, I programmed a bit of code. Oh. Um, it's, as I say, it's a, it's a collaborative venture. I mean, this is an example of open source software. Um, it's free. It's constructed by a digital humanities centre in the US originally. But now there's a whole lot of other people who contribute to the code. Uh, and they do that in a lot of different ways, and one of the ways is by writing translators for different databases. So uh, I wrote, it's, it's in, a, in a language called JavaScript, uh, and it actually just looks at the web page and it finds the bits of information that it wants, and it feeds it to Zotero so it can then save that structured information. So your code is now part of Zotero? That's right. That's right. Yep. And what about if the, if the site you're looking at is a uh, subscription site or something like that? <coughs> um, it, uh, it can, it, it depends how it's set up. Um, there certainly are translators available for some uh, uh, um, paid sites. Um, it, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, there's, no, there's not a sort of blanket answer to that, but certainly it depends on how the, their information is structured. Uh, um, but Zotero, if you're logged in, Zotero should be able to access all the information on that site. Um, um, now, there's some other cool stuff about Zotero. Uh, and one is, uh, another one is that you can share things. So it's not just a matter of say, having your own research database. 
you can actually create groups on the Zotero website. And I should also say that you can choose to sync, uh, synchronize your database with the Zotero server so it can be accessed by any computer that you own. Um, so that if you're using your laptop and your desktop and uh, whatever, you can have them all synchronized uh, via the Zotero server. But you can also choose to uh, create a group. If you're working on a project together, uh, you can create a group and you can all be um, just dragging and dropping material into that group. Um, so it's all available to share. And yes, I have set up a group for Mossman 1418, mm -hmm. uh, which is there. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, so uh, if you're using Zotero and you find material, you can just, uh, uh, first of all, you need to go to the group and just uh, join it. Uh, and uh, we'll, I'll write a blog post about this for the site so it'll have more information. Um, once you've joined the group, you can just drag and drop to that group uh, and it will keep you synchronised across uh, everybody who's accessing that material. So it's a good way of building collaboration across these sorts of data sets as well. What happens if two people get the same information? Uh, it'll be a duplicate. Um, and there are ways of managing duplicates. There's a little tool which will look for duplicates as well. There's other cool things which I won't go into detail now, but for example, if you get a PDF file which you found uh, somewhere, um, like a, a, a journal article, um, you can ask Zotero to go and look for metadata for that PDF file and it'll go over and it'll pull back the, the metadata related to that, um, which is really cool if you like metadata. <laughs> um, okay, Zotero. Now, I just quickly... Uh, sorry, when sorry. you've done that, so if I go in and I want to see, how do I search within that to see what the group's found? Oh. Supposing I'm looking for... Yeah, there's... There's, uh, well, there's all, there's a, you can just search across yeah, the whole search database. Up there. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of uh, different ways of searching material um, uh, within your own database. I mean, once you join a group, that becomes part of your research collection, so you're, you're searching so you across search that. Them. And then, of course, you can tag material yourself if you sort of want to keep track yeah. of things. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Now, I just want to. Quickly show you a couple of other little things. As I said, um, we in the digital humanities make stuff. So I'm going to you know, be a little self-indulgent and show you some stuff that I've made, um, which I think would be useful, hopefully. So, okay, this is my site, or one of them. Um, and uh, you're welcome to explore. But I just want to show you some of these digital tools. Um, okay, there's a couple of little things here. Um, I have a sort of long-running uh, love-hate relationship with Record Search, the National Archives database. Um, <laughs> I love the collection, hate the interface. Um, so uh, I've been uh, over uh, over the number of years, sort of creating little tools which actually improve the interface for me and, ma and make it sort of slightly easier to use. And again, they're all shared, they're all available, you can use them and install them. One which is perhaps particularly relevant for this project is a little script I wrote, which connects mapping our ANZACs to Record Search. So Record Search is the main database of the National Archives. Uh, series B2455 is the World War I service records. But mapping our ANZACs is totally separate. It has information about those service records, but uh, and it, it, mapping our ANZACs links back to the service records. But the service records in record search don't link to mapping our ANZACs. So you can't, for example, go into name search in the National Archives database, find something, and then find the, the mapping our ANZACs record. But now you can, if you use my little script. Um, if I, okay, let's go to the site. Um, oh, I should have said about Zotero too, uh, that it, um, started life as an extension for the Firefox web browser, but now it has a standalone version which will work uh, basically on any system with any browser. So anybody can use it now. Now this is uh, uh, where you can install my little script. And it's, uh, if you're using the Chrome browser, it's a matter of just clicking install. If you're using Firefox, it's slightly more complicated, but there is information about how to do it. It's not really very hard. Um, if we go to a record here, within record search, you'll notice, look, there's a little button. It says view in mapping our ANZACs. Where did that button come from? That button came from my little script. 
Um, and I can prove that to you uh, by switching it off. Never. Okay, so my little script, and you also notice something interesting here. Uh, if you uh, normally view record search, oops, uh, like so, you don't get that nice little bit of information which tells you the number of pages in the digitized mm -hmm. file. So that's another of my little scripts doing some work there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we switch them back on again. So it actually, the script goes off, it looks into the digitized file, sees how many pages there are, and it tells you. Um, where you've, it also works where you've got a list of items. Um, so if you've done a search and you've got a list of items and you want to see where the really juicy big files are, you can easily get a, 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 a glance to see which, which, page, which file has 300 pages in it and which file only has one page. So it just makes it a little more convenient for browsing and for using record search. Um, in the case of this project, you know, if people are going into record search, or as I say, name search and searching for things, um, we obviously want to connect to uh, that file in, in record search. We want to have that URL, but we also want the connection to mapping our ANZACs because there's some information in mapping our ANZACs which isn't in record search. So this makes it easy. You can just click on there, it goes to the record in mapping our ANZACs, and you can capture that URL as well. So again, just a very simple little thing. But it actually does make your life a lot easier when you're working with people. Can I talk user scripts? Yeah. Now, even better. Um, I, I, let's, um, let's switch off again. Uh, okay. So what happens when you click on new digital copy? This is what we see. Um, there's a lot of problems with this page. Uh, one is that you don't actually have any contextual information. You don't know the, the series number or the file number that it came from. Uh, another problem is that if you want to print it, you've got to print it a page at a time, which gets very annoying if it's a long file. How do we get around that? Through the magic of user scripts. Um, let's try that again, shall we? Okay. So, we've got the conditional information, we've got the, 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 the control symbol there. Um, we've uh, been in a lot of time. Okay, it fades in and out. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Um, um, now, perhaps most importantly, most usefully, you can print the whole file, or you can print a range of pages. I'm just using this little, do that here. So that makes life a lot, lot easier. Um, this browsing 3D thing doesn't quite work at the moment. Um, it was using a particular piece of software which isn't sort of being supported much anymore. Um, but I intend to sort of uh, redevelop that because there's actually a whole lot of other options now. It was a visualization of that file. It showed all of the pages of the file on this nice 3D browsable wall. Um, and uh, there are now, since I did that, and that was a few years ago that I actually wrote that script, there was actually more opportunities for visualising that sort of material, so I'm going to actually sort of work on something a bit more, a bit different for using that. Okay, so there's a few tools which can just help you in, in, in doing this sort of digital research. And I say, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are actually developing things and sharing them and making them available for you to use. Um, some, if we go... Um, there's also some stuff for you to play with. Uh, so, those of you who like your newspapers and who think you're pretty good at history, uh, can test yourself with headline roulette. Uh, this is actually drawing a random newspaper uh, article from the Trove newspaper database, and you have to try and guess the year that it was published. Um, and it becomes quite addictive. Strangely, <laughs> um, the uh, there's also um, I, I've been doing a lot of work with the newspapers database um, over the last year or so, 
and one of the outcomes of this is uh, this tool called Query Pick. Um, you uh, put a word or a phrase in it, it goes off, it searches the newspaper database for each year, uh, and it, it takes a little while because it has to get them in chunks, um, and it uses the Trove API. Um, but it brings it back and it shows it as a nice graph showing the uh, number of occurrences of that phrase over time. So it's really useful if you're particularly if you just want to get an idea of the, the trends uh, of uh, where a particular phrase occurs over time. Or if you're sort of starting a research project or just have a bit of a hunch about something and you just want to see, get a visualisation, get a picture of how it, it might uh, have occurred within the newspaper database, it gives you a really quick impression of that. So it would be very good for language researchers, and in other words, if you even a particular word, if you want to say that didn't it, vocabulary till 1870 or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, of course you can, you can do that just in the normal Trove interface in terms of looking at a particular, you know, the earliest reference, but it does actually give you those trends over time, which can be useful. And for example, I had a, a guy contact me recently who's researching larrikins, uh, uh, the, 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 the use of the word larrikin. Um, and uh, so we did a few, I did a few graphs for him to show him the current of Larrikin and I sort of compared Melbourne and Sydney and there were some interesting differences mm. uh, in there too. So, um, this is also your Great War um, example. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's what you see. Um, and it's, uh, again, you know, I, I started off talking about the connections between big pictures and uh, small stories. This is the reason why there's that, that big pick there, uh, by the way, is, is the default view shows you the proportion uh, of the uh, matches of the, the, the number of articles. So that in the early years, there's not many papers, um, so the proportion can seem higher. You can actually switch that if you want to look at the raw number of matching articles. Uh, and so that's what you get there. So searching by Mossman. Yep. yep. Now, if you want to actually drill down, like I said, connecting back to the, the, the stories. Um, the, connecting the big pictures to the stories, you click on any point on that graph, uh, and it pulls up the first uh, 20 articles from Trove. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see, and then if you want to uh, explore that further, you click on those, and it will take you into Trove, and you can actually see the content of that article. Um, uh, and if you want to uh, re repeat the whole search, you can do that there. So, uh, and this, I should say, is possible um, because Trove uh, has what's called an API. An application program interface, which means um, uh, you can create programs, scripts yourself, which actually talk to the computers at the National Library and get back structured information and enable you to build things with it. Uh, doing our bit will have an API so that people can actually construct resources as well. Uh, it's an important thing, and I'll talk more about that later. But this is what becomes possible. People can uh, go off and build tools on top of your resources. They can create new ways of looking at them, which you may want to talk about. And that's what the, the advantage of making this material available in a way that computers can understand. Okay, I'm keeping you from lunch. Um, uh, you might like to explore some other stuff. I've been doing I've been doing some explorations of the way front pages change in newspapers as well over time, uh, because of course they didn't always have the headlines on the front, uh, and but there's quite a lot of difference between your newspapers and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, uh, now, lunch, I was going to, um, we had a, a, on our program a, a mystery box challenge for lunch. Um, and uh, the idea of that is, uh, I'm not, uh, not going to sort of say you have to do it over lunch. Uh, you might have to do it after today. But what I did in our Zotero group, um, in the Zotero library for Boston 2018, I just started assembling pretty much at random a few things which I found. Um, so uh, some events here, which are largely from newspaper articles, uh, some objects, some things from the Australian War Memorial catalog, some people, photographs from the War Memorial, some places. And the challenge was really to see what sort of stories you could create with this sort of material. Uh, and I had in mind, I don't know if any of you know of a service called Storify. Have any of you heard of Storify? It's, it's really uh, quite fun and quite easy to use. Um, so if you just go to storify.com, uh, uh, very quick to sign up. Um, and what you can do is you can actually just uh, create... Uh, 
Um, you can actually just, uh, with those materials which are in the Zotero group, uh, you can actually just uh, get that URL, you can uh, paste it into Storify and it will uh, show you that web page. So this is one of the line where I was talking about some of the newspaper work that I did. And it enables you to send, uh, um, assemble these and to insert your own comments or thoughts as well. You can put in new bits of text. And so it's, it's a fun way of thinking about how you actually use material to put them together as a story in a way which you can then share and other people can view. So this is the, the interface here. So you can grab tweets if somebody's been tweeting about something. Uh, you can grab Twitter photos uh, and put them in. As I said, you can just get a link. So uh, if we go here and have a look at the people, uh, copy that link. from the Royal Memorial. Okay, it's got that from the Royal Memorial. We can just drag that across here. And so then we can just start assembling our resources and we can, if you want to make a comment about that, we can say something here. Um, so my challenge really, and, and as I say, you can fiddle play with this at lunchtime or you can go home and play with it, is to see if you can just assemble some stories using uh, some of the material, either the material that's in the... the uh, there's a Tiro group, and you can actually find it with that URL. Um, or you could just go to the Zotero site and search for Mosman 1418, that will take you there as well. Um, using some of those materials, see what you can make with them. So, uh, and then tell us about them, share them, and we can link to them from the, the, the blog. Uh, uh, and we can all sort of, uh, because it's a way of thinking about how we use these materials and the sorts of stories we might be telling, which is valuable. But, time for lunch. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>